Well, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Ed, for inviting me. And um, I'm excited because what I need help in is getting the word out about uh, the Johnson Space Center. So in my comments, there are two things that if you get nothing else, thank you, if you get nothing else from, from the presentation this morning, the first is to turn around the perception that Johnson Space Center is closing with the end of the shuttle program, that we've got an exciting future. Actually, the year, years ahead of us are some of the best years that, um, that I'm looking forward to. And that is what I hope to convey this morning. And the second one is that the message has changed and the audience is changing, and that I really would love your ideas, your thoughts, your support in being able to get out the message of, of human exploration of space and what an exciting future it has. So, 23 years ago, I started at NASA, and what brought me to NASA was not what brought a lot of my colleagues. It wasn't this. My 17-year-old son said, you want me to edit that? You want me to make it shorter, quicker, and stuff? He says, this takes too long between the pauses. But no, what brought me to, uh, <laughs> I said, no, we need to, be, to keep it to, to the original. But what brought me was this. And that's what got me started. And, and it's already showed a difference between the um, generations. Half of my peers came in, and they were wanting to, to go back to be the uh, uh, first step on the moon. And for me, I wanted to go boldly go where no one had gone before. And so back in uh, New York, where I was born and grew up in Jersey, about eighth grade, the, the, the magic stuck, the vision uh, stuck. And I remember being in eighth grade and uh, um, knowing that I wanted to go to NASA, knowing that I didn't want to be an astronaut because at the time you had to be a, a fighter pilot and I didn't want to go into the military. But I knew I wanted to get into computers. And so eighth grade, go to the guidance council, getting ready to put together my high school plan, and I was going to go college prep, and uh, being the only Hispanic uh, family in the school, the guidance counselor looked at it and said, uh, college prep, I don't think so. I think you uh, need to go to automotive uh, class. Uh, I said, no, I'm going to college. He said, no, you really need to go to auto shop. I think that's, that's more your, um, your speed. And I said, no, no, no one's going to keep me from going where no one has gone before. And so, went to, uh, thank you. <laughs> Went to, um, went to school in Boston University, got an uh, undergraduate in computer engineering, did my graduate work at Texas A&M. Um, that's where my wife says I really went to school. Um, then so uh, um, met my wife there. I told her when we first met, I met her the second week of school, I told her there's nothing that's going to keep me in Texas. I'm not going to date anyone. I'm going right back up to the Northeast. And... Uh, so we played a lot of racquetball for six months, and after watching her in shorts for six months, that was it. And, uh, <laughs> and here I am. But when I finally got to NASA, and I, and I went there straight from Texas A&M, I was expecting this. I thought, NASA, well, you know, it's, it's been now 69, it's been almost 20 years since um, we went to the moon, and, and I'm ready to, to start working on transporter rooms and phasers and, and all of that. And instead, I end up here. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. Every time I go back in there, and it's a historical monument, if anyone ever gets a chance to go down to Space Center Houston, they'll, they'll tour you through there. And it still absolutely is inspiring, and it still makes uh, um, sense chills every time I go into the room. Um, but it wasn't the deck of the Starship Enterprise. And this is, was part of the challenge, because we were bringing children at the time, and they'd go in there, and they'd come up here, to this little spot here, and they would look at it and they would ask their, their mom and dad, what's this? And what you can't see in the picture, but what's actually in there is a little dial tone. And they would, you know, so here you are, you're trying to expire the next generation and you still have equipment there that is using the old rotary phones um, to be able to, do, to contact each other. And so from here, I've tried to bring new technology to try to create that mission control center that looked like the deck of the Starship Enterprise. And was able to move on and be able to train a crew of astronauts. Um, it was a, a phenomenal experience. Two years of being able to um, get this crew that went up in the summer of 1994 up into uh, to space. It was, they were on board the shuttle Columbia. And 
normally when you get to train a crew, you get to go and see the launch in, from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And I didn't get to go, go because at the same time that they were preparing to launch, my son was about to be born. So I figured I'd stay around for that launch instead of seeing the other one. And uh, haven't regretted that one bit. And while he was up, um, the crew was up in space, he was born actually on the 25th anniversary of us landing on the moon. Nothing that I planned, my, my, I didn't tell my wife, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> but while he, when he was born, she, um, um, Mission Control called up to, um, to the crew up in, in space and told them about my son's birth. And they called down, uh, Jim Hassel, the pilot, called back down to Mission Control and said, um, Houston, this is Columbia, just like to congratulate Gonzalez on the birth of his son. And so I've got my son's birth announcement from space. As, uh, um, so I got to do this, and um, it was phenomenal, but yet it still wasn't going where no one had gone before. And so I returned back to, to the technology, to what I love, because I found out that after two years, um, I'm actually a lousy instructor. Um, I'm a big picture person trying to be able to focus on the details. Was, uh, was a bit of a challenge. And so, got to work on mission control, and I thought I, I finally made it when the Houston Chronicle compared this new control room at, um, at Johnson Space Center to look like the deck of the Starship Enterprise. I still try to stretch it to make sure that what they said actually matches that picture, but it was, it was nice. It was a nice uh, a compliment to be able to get the technology there. Yet something was missing, and actually there's, um, three shifts in my perspective in NASA and three shifts in the message that I share and it was at this point that all of a sudden the second shift came on. I came in originally to go where no one gone before to be able to explore, to be the one that went out there. <clears throat> but it was about this time that all of a sudden I was working my way up the leadership chain up in, in NASA trying to figure out how do I um, get to the top level management position, and the feeling was gone. I had gone to a, a leadership class. A gentleman by the name of Peter Senge was doing this uh, session, and I don't remember a single word that he said, but he showed this video. And in this video, there was a gentleman that was going to um, Italy. He was a violent make maker, and he wanted to go to the hometown of Stradivarius and to be surrounded by people that were passionate about what they did. And he wanted to feel passionate about what he did. And you could see that passion, and he was surrounded by people that were just um, Fired to, to get up and to be able to make these violins. And I told my wife, you know, after uh, 10 years at NASA, the passion is gone. And I said, I'm way too young um, at the time. This was before my gray hair um, um, to, to have the fire go. And she said, okay, fine, you've been talking about this for a while. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I need to get back to the technology, get back to, uh, to why I had come there. But also started formulating in my mind that my son and daughter, I needed to do something for them. And so it started coming the idea of being able to, what I did at NASA was to enable them to have an opportunity to go into space. What we were about was trying to make sure that the idea of living on the moon or vacation on the moon became a reality in their lifetime, or at least for their son and daughter. And so it's wonderful, these, these images here are from children around the world. Um, there was an event last uh, spring um, that NASA has sponsored to be able to get artwork, and this is from uh, a Russian child, um, about 11 years old, who captures what I wanted. I wanted to be able to get back to the moon and Mars, to be able to, to focus on, on that. And what I wanted to be able to do is be able to, to get to that base, to get to that place on the moon, and to be able to have this generation feel that connection, to be able to feel that they could have the moon within their grasp and within their reach. And so a team of us got together and we looked at the um, year 2076. Um, there's a, a wonderful uh, novel by Robert Highland called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And so we were about creating a place where a next generation would be able to, to live and, 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 and work. And actually, this image, if, uh, if you're not familiar with his work, is Pat Rawlings, a uh, space artist who has uh, phenomenal drawings out there and uh, wonderfully inspiring. And 
it was amazing that this past year when we did that art contest, we had um, children that understood the challenge of living on the moon, that to actually live there, it's, it's, it is a harsh environment, but it's because if you live underneath the ground, it protects you from all the radiation. So here it is, a child somewhere in the Middle East uh, that put together this image that is, uh, captures the, the feeling. And all of a sudden, you see the connections being made through the art. Uh, I love the woman that heads up this program. She's, she's calling it STEAM. She wants to put the arts back into STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, uh, and that, that ability to see themselves on the moon, to be able to see themselves as a, vi a vision for the future, to see space within their grasp, is now making the connection, now allowing them to, to see this not as we did um, 40 years ago, which is um, the, you only have the right stuff, a, a, a couple of astronauts that get to the, to the moon, um, but actually they can see themselves as being on their being able to play there on the floor. And so this was where I wanted to go. This is where our team at JSC was working on. This is the technology to be able to create that environment there that reaches out. And so started on a path six years ago at the Johnson Space Center to look at how we position JSC for the future. And the center director wanted us to look out 20 years to look out, not to 2076, but let's just go out to, into the 2020s and figure out how we position the center. And it was interesting when we started that, that process, we asked them, okay, so you've got a whole generation that actually will be here in 20 years. You were asking us to work with the leadership team, but we'd rather, or in addition to the team, we like to work with those people that actually are going to be here 20 years and now leading up the center. And so the center director, um, bought off on the idea and said, okay, bring together um, about 30 of uh, the young engineers and get them working here to put together a strategy for the future. Well, before we brought them in, um, actually yesterday you had um, here at, at the conference Nick Skidlin, he and a, a team of, of three others have put together a presentation to say, okay, um, what does the NASA mission and a space exploration mean to his generation? And they had um, gathered a lot of data and statistics on it. And it was rather sobering um, to find out that for their generation, they're not engaged. That a majority of them don't understand why NASA. What does it have to do with, with um, what they're doing? And it was um, a surprise. Because everyone, you know, especially even though I, I um, do a lot of presentations outside, it still had this philosophy that everyone loves the meeple, everyone loves NASA, but then they told us that, and through the data that they discovered, and this, is, this data is about five years old now, but 40% actually are, um, are not supportive of it. It just breaks my heart. And, but they said what the challenge is, is that they just don't understand. We don't communicate in a way that makes sense. We continue on with the old images, with the old ways of doing things. Um, as one person has said, we love to talk about the toys, if you will, about the rockets, about the vehicles. Um, actually, Pat Rowling, all of his images try to capture the inspiration of the people, not the toys, not the rockets. And for this generation, they kept saying, where is the connection to the people? What is the connection to, to making a difference? What is, where is it that allows us to see ourselves in the future? And so it's not surprising that they are they don't get it and because of the amount of, as they said in their presentation, how much they're being inundated. And my, this is old, this is four years old. My son probably has hit about a, a two thirds of those already. And, uh, and how do you break through to, to that community with the NASA message? How do you break through to show them that it is relevant to, to them today? And so it was also interesting when, when we um, brought them together that their image of NASA and what brought them there was a little bit different than mine. So mine was Star Trek, but theirs actually was Apollo 13. It's interesting that um, all of them came in and they said it was the, for my colleagues, it was the one man standing, stepping off the, the lunar module and um, um, making that first step. 
for them, it was the team. It was the, the group that came together that uh, said uh, failure is not an option, which unfortunately, as much as it is incredible, uh, that, that, that phrase drives me crazy. Um, because it also set us down a path where um, failure is, um, you, it makes sense in the context of space, but on the ground, we need to be able to fail to be able to do things that we want to do. But they came together as a team, and so they said, we need to be able to, to show um, they wanted to be in an environment where the team comes together, where, where it's not the individual that is celebrated, but it's a team that is able to, to move forward. And when they came together after um, a month of putting together a strategy for the, for the center, at the end of the day, they wanted the same thing. It was amazing that after, at the end of the day that they still wanted to, to explore, to go where no one had gone before. Yet they wanted to do it collaboratively. They wanted to do it uh, connected-wise. They wanted to be able to do it in a way that would bring other people and get other people engaged in putting together the programs, get other people's insights, ideas, perspectives on how we actually move forward to do human exploration of space. And they wanted to be able to, to reach far, to be able to explore. And yet they didn't have the same division that we had before, where there was a, a difference between human exploration of space and robotic exploration. For them, it was just different means to be able to get out there. And they were, wanted to, to be international and collaborative. And they were, you know, it was interesting. The common philosophy at the time was, all we need is another space race. Let's go ahead. And uh, if we just got the Chinese to back in the space race with us, like we did with the Russians, we'd be able to do incredible things. And they said, we don't want a space race. We want a collaboration. We, don't, we want everyone to work together. Um, already, a lot of them go to International Space University, or um, they have uh, uh, partnerships and relationships with um, team members and in international agencies all around, around the world. And so that's what they were looking for. And so we were moving forward with uh, the strategy for the center, looking to build at Johnson Space Center an innovation park, building relationships, positioning the center so that it can go beyond low Earth orbit, to be able to focus on getting to the moon, to Mars, or, or an asteroid. And it was um, a great time and, and a, a, an incredible part of my career. And then the third shift came in my, in my thinking of where we needed to go. From going to where no one had gone before, to getting to the moon to allow my son and daughter to vacation, to a point where now my focus and what I'm hoping to get your help in is Houston. Because Right when all of the division has started, right when we got together the team to, to move forward, um, my son was uh, diagnosed with a rare version of leukemia. And it was uh, five years ago um, next week that the doctors told us that he had a 2% chance of, of, of making it. And the good news is that now he is a, a junior in college. He's looking at um, being able to um, go to uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. He wants to be a, a game designer. He's already made um, games for, uh, for kids at the hospital. When, um, when he uh, got out after his first year, he had made a video game um, with a program called Game Maker. And in his video game, he was able to um, take Pac-Man but in his version of Pac-Man, the, the Pac-Man were the children and the ghosts represented the cancer cells. And after 15 levels, when you beat the game, a screen pops up and said, you just beat cancer. And so he just went off on the Christmas Eve and delivered them to, to the kids there in the hospital. But when you have an experience where every day is a gift, and, when, and my son, he teaches me this every day. He, he took me out to... Uh, New Mexico this summer, we went uh, backpacking up in uh, 30 miles east of Taos for a two-week backpacking trip. Um, it's supposed to be 70 miles. I think we ended up doing about 90 miles with, with the other scouts. And uh, he got me to, uh, to mountain climb and repel. And even though you, you showed me with, uh, with, uh, in space, me and heights don't do very well. But he's, uh, he, he, especially when they tell you to you know, go off the edge of, a, of the cliff and just keep leaning back off a perfectly good hill. So. Um, he, uh, so when you get to the point where um, 
every day is a gift, the idea of him going to the moon and being able to vacation there was, was wonderful, but I needed to make sure that what he and his sister had here was more opportunity. They needed to be able to, I needed to know that human exploration of space and what Houston was about would offer them more opportunities than when, um, when, they, when they graduated from, from college. And here my, my daughter is, um, she's phenomenal. When um, she found out that her brother was, had cancer, he need, his version of leukemia required a bone marrow transplant. And so she was determined to be his donor. And she, when she found out that she wasn't a match, she looked for every way to, uh, to help her out, out her brother, including she, uh, she's an entrepreneur in her own right. She, uh, at the age of 10, had worked with, um, with her aunts and uncles and cousins and, and set up a little business. She had called the little business uh, Miracle Massages and More. So anytime her aunts, uncles, grandparents, and nieces and nephews came over, she would give them massages, manicures, pedicures, facials, the whole, the whole work. And after a month, my wife said, you know how much our daughter has made? And I said, no. And she said, in a month, our 10-year-old has made $250. Um, so uh, we quickly incorporated her and, and, uh, and we took some options on her. Um, and, and here you see her. She um, is donating her hair for a lock of love to, to help out her brother. So for me, as, as this one um, child captured, Houston has to be the place where hum the, the, uh, the next generation, the next era of human space exploration is sparked from. We've had an incredible 50 years so far, but the next 50 years has to be a place where if you want to be able to go to, to explore, if you want to be um, about um, space exploration, if you want to be able to do some of the suborbital activities I'll share with you in a moment, Houston is, is, is a place. If you want to find, start up a new company, if you want to be able to invest, it's Houston. And so that's what actually brought me to the Houston Technology Center where I'm at for the next year, is to be able to see if we can create that new environment, to be able to um, attract to, to the Clear Lake area entrepreneurs and, and new investments to be able to create new companies so that this vision will become a reality. And we, so once again with Pat Rawlings, we had put together a comic to try to reach another generation. Um, it's interesting when we first introduced this to, to see how one generation loved it, another generation thought it was, uh, was silly and hokey and, and didn't support it. But it, it was to show that the Johnson Space Center had a rich future. Because when we introduced this comic two years ago, it was right when everything was turning upside down and it seemed like um, with the shuttle program that there wasn't a future. And in reality, we've got expertise, capability, technology. We've got the astronauts. We've got mission control. We've got so much here in Houston. And we have an environment around us of, of so much entrepreneurial uh, spirit that the next 50 years is going to be phenomenal. And so we started off with 2069 the 100th anniversary of us landing on the moon. And if anyone's interested, I could get you the, the pages. Um, but um, we wrapped up with 2169, um, the great science fiction story that he put together for, for this. So the question now remains is, what's going on now? What is happening here? Because as I started off, the belief is that with the end of the shuttle program, the end of the Johnson Space Center, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. And right now, we have circling above the Earth at 200 miles, six um, astronauts um, working on the most incredible vehicle that has ever been put together by, um, by an international community. But um, it is 12 years in the making. It is a laboratory that covers a couple of uh, football fields. It has participation from the European Space Agency, from the Russian Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency. Um, the crew is international. It is up there, um, continuously manned for the past um, uh, 10 or so years. It has been have a crew of six for the last 
um, two to three years. And it is doing things right now that is um, helping out life here back on Earth. Um, one company here in Houston, Astrogenetics, has sent up experiments up on space station that is looking at the Salmonella, salmonella vi virus. And from their experiments, they believe they have a, a vaccine for the virus for when people get sick with that, and also have countermeasures for, for where it's found at the source. Because they found out that that virus up in space is a lot more aggressive. And because of it, and the way it behaves, they were able to find solutions that they couldn't back here on Earth, because on Earth it's a lot slower um, virus. But this space station is controlled out of, out of Houston. The management is, is down here in Houston. The um, astronauts are still trained, trained down here in Houston. And we have, relation, have an opportunity with the medical center and with the community ar around us to be able to take the discoveries on board that vehicle and bring them back down and create new industries like astrogenetics is doing down here in Houston. But not only is this exciting, but with the end of the shuttle program, we're entering a new phase where NASA is now returning back to what we're about, to exploration of space, because now we've got other companies like Bigelow. Entrepreneur out in Vegas made his, uh, his millions in Vegas with um, building microtels in, uh, in Vegas and decided that he wanted to create the first hotel in space. And he got, came to NASA and he asked if we had any technology. And about a, a dozen years or so, we were working on a, a project called TransHab, where we're building inflatable habitats. And so he came by and he said, can I take that technology? And so right now, he has a two-thirds scale version of this module circling up in space. He's got a, so he's waiting to send up his full scale one um, so that you can have the first space hotel up in space, the challenges that he needed a ride. And when he came to NASA the second time, he says, okay, I got the technology, but I need some additional help because the technology we had developed didn't put a window on there. And he says, if I'm gonna build a hotel, but no one can look outside, not many people are gonna pay the money to get up there. So now the version that he has circling around the Earth has a window to allow people to look out. But he put this up six years ago, the first, or about five years ago. Um, but he's been waiting for the ride, and now we've got the industry growing up to, to give rides. Up in Dallas, you've got Armadillo, a great story because there's a bunch of volunteers that on the weekends, that start up on weekends and evenings after they have the full-time job, they come together because they wanted to build a space vehicle. And they were competing for a prize. It was known as the Grumman um, X Prize. And to be able to have a vehicle that would go up, translate over, and uh, land another spot you know, with the accuracy of a dime, and then do it a couple of times. And a bunch of volunteers. And there was another company out in California, Maston, father and son team that actually did the same thing. So you have all of a sudden these new um, players in the market that we never had before, including SpaceX. Elon Musk made his millions. He's, you know, he's doing Tesla also at the same time, the, the electric race car. Um, but working here, he's, he's going to be flying um, to the space station at the end of this year with his payload. So now we have new companies, new commercial companies providing access to space. And in a couple of years, he hopes, along with his other um, um, companies, similar companies, you've got um, Blue Origins, originally in West Texas, now is up in uh, Washington State. Um, you've got Orbital, um, Sierra Nevada in Colorado. Um, you've got uh, um, about a half a dozen other companies that are working together to be able to provide access to space, where before it was only the sole domain of NASA. And so with that, the opportunities are endless because now what we can do is to build that vehicle that I started off with that NASA can focus on building a vehicle that just stays in space, kind of like the enterprise. It allows us to be able to look at the technology. There's, there's activities now looking at how do you build a fuel depot in space as opposed to have taken everything with you on the ground because, as a friend of mine said, when you take a trip across country, you don't take all the fuel with you and put it on into your, um, into your car and try to make it all the way to California. You're able to stop along the way. Now, we're looking at, at strategies and technologies to allow us to be able to refuel and do things along the way instead of trying to just haul up everything in one shot. 
and the one that is, is even as incredible as you've heard about the XPRIZE that allowed um, Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic to, to be able to do their, uh, their launch, to be able to, to show that we can do suborbital spaceflight. Well, Google t partnered up with the XPRIZE, and they've got something called the Google Lunar XPRIZE, and hopefully we'll see a winner next year. And we've got a couple dozen teams that are uh, um, committed for the Google Lunar XPRIZE. And it's supposed to be uh, the winner of the team will be the one that is able to send a satellite to the moon, and they will get additional um, prizes depending on what they're able to do on the moon. If they're able to go to a, an Apollo site and send back high-definition video, they get extra, extra money. If they're able to translate a certain amount of distance, um, then they get extra money. The incredible part of it is that, as I was talking to Peter Diamandis, the, the head of the XPRIZE, he says, people that submit these ideas aren't constrained with the way that we have done things before. Because he said, you know, when NASA sends a, a vehicle, they put lots of experiments, they put a lot of instruments on there. We're trying to do tons of things in order to be able to, to get to the, to the moon or to Mars. And when you do that, you build a, a two-ton robot that requires a lot more propulsion. He says, what they're coming back with are things about this size. And when you send something this small up to, to the moon, it's a lot smaller rocket that can do things, but they send a bunch of them and they, they move around, they become a little, um, if you will, a little uh, uh, spider web of, 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 of robots to go around and explore and, and do things, um, while you, instead of sending up one big thing. It's just amazing how the community is coming together to be able to move forward and to, to allow us to be able to explore space. And so with all of that here, we should be able to create in Houston the, the seed for the next generation of, of human space exploration. What we're doing at the Houston Technology Center is trying to make lemonade out of, out of lemons with uh, the workforce that now has been laid off. Um, unfortunately, yes, with the shuttle um, coming to a completion, we have about 4,000 individuals that are now looking for the next opportunities. And what's amazing is that the city and industry is, is helping out us and pulling out every, all the stops in order to help out the community down there. I mean, we've got, if you've seen in the paper, we've had the um, energy industry and the petrochemical coming down is um, looking to try to capture the talent down there. But what we're doing with the Houston Technology Center is trying to see, okay, of those engineers that are available now, who has the stomach to become an entrepreneur? Who has um, with the, the, the desire to take their technology, take their capabilities, to take their, their great ideas and turn them into a new company that will allow us to do things that we hadn't done before? And so we've done a couple of workshops down there, and we've had engineers popping up with their business plans to come forward um, with their ideas to start up companies that will either go into aerospace or help out other industries. We've had some that will have technologies that will help out energy or the life sciences. But then the other thing actually we're doing tomorrow down in Clear Lake is saying, okay, not all engineers make good CEOs. Um, yeah, I know, it's a revelation to, to, to some. Um, so what we're saying is tomorrow we're bringing down some entrepreneurs, some CEOs that have done this before, done it a couple of times, looking for the next opportunity and saying, okay, talk to these engineers and see if a match can be made. The person has the, the technology, the capabilities. If we bring them with someone that has been successful in creating companies, can they create some new opportunities and be able to allow us to, to keep that talent and workforce here? Because we are going to, to explore. We are going to be um, breaking beyond the boundaries of low Earth orbit. And we need that to be able to keep that, that expertise, that talent, and to be able to attract new ones here. And so what I would love your help on is being able to get that word out, to be able to, to share, especially, as I said, there's different messages to different communities. There are different um, ways that NASA resonates with, with, with individuals. 
Um, what we have, what started me there 23 years ago isn't what keeps me there today. And so, in your work and what you were able to do, how can the NASA message be brought to, to a larger community? And how can we get the image to turn around that Houston is the place to be for exploration? That it's not in New Mexico with the new spaceport there. It's not in California. It's not in Colorado. It's Houston. Because what I firmly believe and what I would love to see is that when we get here, that there's only one word that should be the first word out of the astronaut's mouth when they get there. It should be the same thing as when we get, went down on the moon, and it'll be the same. And we've got to start now to be able to make sure that that becomes a reality. That at the end of the day, that this is the birthplace of of the next generation of space exploration is the birthplace of where we're able to um, send communities up into space. And it's the birthplace where, if you will, space commerce um, and, and space industry, the, the next generation of it is found. So help me make those words a reality. With that, thank you. And I'll take any questions that you may have. So I don't think Stephen's giving away any free Mar Martian trips today, um, but I'm sure that uh, you will be more than happy to answer some questions. Sorry, guys. Come on. <laughs> Give me coffee. What do you want? So we, we have time for probably two or three questions, um, and Stephen has availability Absolutely. to hang yeah. out. So yeah. definitely, if we don't get to you, do not panic. You know, you'll definitely have all of your questions and dreams uh, discussed and more. So who wants to start? Any questions? Yes. Oh. Am I back into my jogging routine again? Okay. I wore better shoes today. Some of your statistics note that um, certain demographics are resistant to express an interest in space exploration and I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but is the reason uh, related to not seeing a practical application for it in our everyday lives or not realizing the importance of it in our everyday lives? Um, we, we don't know exactly why. Um, the, the team that presented the data speculated on a couple of things. Um, one was that, yes, they didn't see the application. The other part, they saw it as an environment for a few. So, you know, what you see. As I said, when we started off, it was it, we talked about the, those with the right stuff. We talked about the, the Apollo team. And that generation was looking for the collective. How do things come together? And that's why the Apollo 13 resonates with them. And then the other one is, with such a focus on uh, the thing that kept coming up again was that they want those uh, grand missions. Though they like to be able to do things that will change the world. They didn't see how this actually changed the world, but in reality, um, what we do, I mean, another small example of, of what the um, Johnson Space Center does from human exploration that helps out kids over at uh, um, premature infants over at MD Anderson, I'm not MD Anderson, at Texas Children. It was uh, about three years ago, Texas Children had come by and saying, we have a challenge when we transport our premature infants, and in that the transportation of, of them shakes them quite a bit and it injures them. And so they said, do you have anything that, that could help us out with that? And so on the shuttle, there's a, some technology that helps to dampen out the vibration on there so it doesn't shake the astronauts apart when they, they, they launch. But also on space station, they have a treadmill that allows them to, uh, to exercise and keep up their muscles and, and their bone strength while they're up there. But at the same time, you've got experiments that are needing to that microgravity environment to be able to, to perform. And so they've got technology that keeps the, the treadmill from um, shaking the station apart. Um, and that technology is now being applied to the transportation of these premature infants. And so you've got um, things that, and it goes back to also to, to these engineers, you've got technologies that can help out other worlds but, or other industries, but we don't have 
the understanding of the problems in those industries, and hopefully tomorrow we can start on that path. But it's those connections that people don't understand. Actually, the Senate director, every time he does a presentation, he'll start off by asking the audience, okay, how many people know or have had LASIK surgery, eye surgery? And, uh, and once um, he gets the um, hands raised, he says, you're welcome, because that technology came from NASA to be able to do that precision uh, um, surgery that, that you have there. So that's what part of our challenge is that we don't explain that connection well enough to, to the larger population. Kind of a two-part question. One, um, it seems like America has kind of surrendered to Russia as far as it comes to getting to space. We don't have any heavy lift uh, vehicle that I know of. And in Washington right now and in the debates that are going on, I see no political will. Uh, it's as if we've just kind of surrendered. Do you see that changing? And is that something that we as a group should be addressing in some manner? And so how? how? OK, um, excellent. So yes, with the. Um, as far as human access to space, um, the only um, nation that has that capability is Russia. Um, as far as large rockets, every nation has one. And we have um, large rockets that we use for sending satellites into space. Um, but as far as being able to send crews, um, Russia is the only one that has it. The shift has come and is that Congress, the administration, is trying to create a new industry. And unfortunately, we started a little, little late on that. But the Elon Musk, the um, Richard Branson's, um, those new companies, they're wanting to help get them providing access into space and to be able to create a new economy from, from there. Um, so they're investing quite a bit of the NASA budget to that to be able to help it out. And the difference is that the money that they're investing isn't for the complete building of these rockets. It's just showing that we're willing to invest, and they need to find uh, the money and the matching funds elsewhere to be able to do it. So in about, you know, if you, you listen to, to those companies, in three years, they'll have human access to space. We'll see um, if we'll get there, but that's what they're predicting. They're, they got um, access to be able to provide payloads in space real quick. Um, they're able to do that this year, but they're supposed to get there. The other piece is that NASA just got a, um, endorsed last week, two weeks ago, to build a rocket that's even bigger than what was built, uh, than the Apollo, um, than the Saturn V. Um, to be able to get us beyond um, low Earth orbit to go onto an astronaut, asteroid or, or, or Mars. Right now, Congress and the President and the authorization for NASA said, next thing you need to go to an asteroid in the 2020 time frame, in the mid-20s, and to Mars in the mid-30s. And the only way to get there is with a rocket of that size. So the development is underway on that. Um, they're using the, some new technology and some technology that we've uh, validated with the, the shuttle um, um, rockets. So that's the piece that um, people don't understand. They, they think it's an either or. That um, end of shuttle program, end of NASA having access to space, means that NASA is no longer in the business and that America is getting out of the business of space exploration. The reality is that NASA is trying to be returned back to exploration, to get back to what it was founded where to go where um, no one else has gone before, and to build a new industry at the same time that allows NASA to leverage that and not have to do all the investments in doing that. Because quite frankly, as incredible of a vehicle as the shuttle was, it was an expensive vehicle. And to be able to do that and maintain that kept NASA from being able to do some of the exploration activities that it wanted to do. Now we're having a commercial industry provide that, and we hit the ride on it. It frees up the, the resources we get from the government to be able to do that exploring. Guys, can we get a round of a, oh, oh. Hold, hold the round. <laughs> Make it a half circle. <laughs> One last question. Just had a quick question. How does NASA's maintaining discovery, Earth like planet discovered, how does that um, 
it introduces new ideas and um, new activities that NASA has to respond to. A perfect example is um, last summer, DARPA partnered up with one of the NASA centers to introduce the 100-year challenge. Because now that you're finding planets and stuff, they're uh, and actually they're taking applications um, for people to plan a mission to go to that planet. But it would be 100 years. It's a one-way ticket. Um, it would be, uh, what would you do if you were to send a contingent of, of uh, people from Earth to that distant planet to be able to extend um, humanity to, to another uh, galaxy? But as far as the core mission, it actually changes more so with administration than it does with discoveries, unfortunately. It's uh, part of our reality. Um, and when a new administration comes in, depending on what discoveries have been made, depending on what, whether or not uh, they focus us one way or the other. Um, hopefully, um, with uh, the support that we're getting from, from both sides of, 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 of Congress, um, and wanting us to be able to do the exploration, we'll be able to stay on that too for the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Okay, now right. a huge round of applause. <laughs> that was awesome.